morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session where we'll be looking at local land charges and the migration to the land registry. My name is Stephen Smith, and I'm delighted to be joined, as always, by Ian Quayle and my colleague Robert Kelly. Morning. Good morning to you both. Morning, Stephen. Good morning. Good morning. Before I hand over to Ian, I'd just like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You're listening in using your computer system by default. If you'd prefer to join over the phone, you can just set the telephone option in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity throughout the course of today to submit questions to Ian by typing your questions in the questions pane of your control panel. You can send questions at any time during the presentation, but we will collect these and address them at Q&A at the end of today's presentation. You can also raise your hand on your control panel during the presentation if you are having any difficulties with the sound or any other technical issues. I'm not an IT whiz myself, but I will be able to speak to you over the chat function if you are having any issues with uh, sound or connection. Finally, we've uh, included notes for today's session in the notes section of your control panel. Um, for some of you, that may say handouts. Um, we've also included links to our YouTube channel and our LinkedIn page. Our LinkedIn page has details of all the webinars we run and news of our new products. And on YouTube, you can find the recordings of the webinar sessions, as well as walkthrough guides for our online ordering portal. Anyway, that's enough from me. I will now pass you on to Ian for the main, main part of today's presentation. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Robert. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming along today. What we're going to do today is have a look at some local land charge issues, some sort of general issues from a transactional lawyer's perspective, then look at the migration for local land charges from local authorities to the land registry and see how that's going to impact on the conveyancing process and conveyancing systems. Stephen was saying uh, there are notes that accompany today's presentation. As far as questions are concerned, you know that there is a chat uh, vehicle uh, in connection with the webinar that you can utilise and also you can send me an email or just do a title an email about any questions or queries you may have with regard to any of the points that we explore or develop. So quite a lot of things to talk about really relating to local land charges, uh, looking at best practice and then looking at the issue concerning migration. Um, just before we sort of uh, delve into the notes and delve into the uh, slides, two or three points that uh, I think are, are significant that I want to uh, refer you to. Firstly, there isn't a sort of big bang moment with regard to migration to the land registry of local land charges. It is a process that uh, is being undertaken uh, slowly that uh, enables the land registry and indeed local authorities to transmit information uh, in a meaningful way and you're not going to all of a sudden have a radical new system sort of being imposed on you. Different local authorities have been given target dates with regard to the migration of local land charges from uh, the local land charges department of the local council to the land registry. The good news with regard to that migration is that what we will see is that eventually there will be a standardized system, a system that uh, is available 24-7, a system that is relatively cheap, and a system that means that where we do have problems with COVID, staffing issues, etc., uh, all of those issues should not impact on our ability to obtain a local land charge as such. There may be issues with regard to local authorities in connection with the obtaining of information relating to land charges, but the actual char land charges search itself should be a relatively simple process for us to uh, undertake and for us to obtain information. So, without further ado then, let's just have a look at things. Why have we got this change? Well, the Land Charges Act 1975 created a register of local land charges and ensured that those charges were open to public inspection. The different regimes that local authorities use mean that some are entirely digital, some are paper-based, and some an amalgamation of the two. Some local authorities are very swift with regard to producing search results, others have been particularly slow, and some that have been slow have been even slower as a consequence of staffing problems and COVID. So what we had in the Infrastructure Act 2015 was a sort of a, a requirement, a goal, to transfer responsibility for 336 registers to the land registry. Why? Well, one, the creation of a single digital local land charges register. Two, perhaps the idea that the land registry becomes more of a hub 
with regard to searches. So perhaps this is the first step in a number of steps whereby the land registry becomes the core of our obtaining searches in connection with residential and commercial conveyancing. Important point to be aware of that I emphasise in the notes, there is no change with regard to local authority inquiries. This purely and simply relates to local land charges and just purely and simply relates to the register itself or the registers themselves. Where information is sought or required with regard to land charges, it will still be necessary to contact and communicate with local authorities for information, although some of that information should be available on the land registry website. So generally speaking, it seems to be good news, doesn't it? Seems to me that uh, what we've got is a win-win for the search industry, search provider industry, and a win for lawyers, and uh, also a, a, a win for local authorities, in that this difficult um, sort of um, task with regard to keeping registers, keeping registers up to date and providing a service to the public, to lawyers and search providers, is being taken away from them, being centralised and being digitalised. I mentioned in the notes a number of important points that I want to share with you before we go any further. And this is really looking at due diligence and good practice. So the question I pose on the slide here, is a local land charges search always necessary in any event? And in short, I think the answer to this is yes, except if we're dealing with short leases or tenancy agreements, or where a client is happy to proceed without a local land charges search, and there's no lender involvement. And I want to stop there and talk to you for a moment about what is the position where we've got a cash buyer client, perhaps who's hell-bent on getting a transaction completed as swiftly as possible and is happy to proceed without a local land charges search or perhaps searches generally. Well, what should we need to do in those circumstances? A lot of firms would be happy to proceed but would want the client to sign some form of waiver or disclaimer. And I think we've got to be careful with regard to that as we're going to see in a moment or two. Why do we have to be careful? Well, first of all, remember we've spoken in the past about informed consent. A client can only consent to instruct us to do something or authorise us to do something or hear not to do something if they're aware of the consequences. And secondly, it's important to understand that is the client really just time sensitive and therefore willing to uh, waive uh, responsibility or waive potential liability concerning local land charges just to get the deal done or is there another factor where the client is only wanting us not to do a local land charges search just because there's likely to be a delay I think can cause us problems so as I mentioned in the notes at page two there clients need to be aware of the, the situation where we proceed without a local land charges search. So let's put to one side the issue of indemnity insurance for a moment or two and just say the client says, ain't got time, not interested, I'll just buy the property, warts and all, I'm authorising you to proceed to exchange of contracts without a local land charges search. Does the client understand and appreciate that the client will be bound by any local land charges that apply to the property? upon completion? Is the client aware of that? Is the client aware of the potential financial consequences of adopting such a strategy with regard to acquisition of the property? Do we ensure that clients are aware of indemnity cover that's available for late searches or for not bothering with searches at all? Is it really just time that is meaning the client is taking the sort of the, the route, the devil may care route of just proceeding without this search in any event. We need, I think, to be careful to make sure our client understands the position and that we understand our client's position. And I think certainly there would be an argument that we would be negligent if a client is saying, I don't want a local land charges search, if we don't explain to the client the availability of indemnity cover. So if you look at page three of the notes I mentioned, we should advise a client why a local land charges search is necessary, advise the client that they're going to be bound by any search entry, whether the search is undertaken or not, understand and appreciate this issue of informed consent from the client and ask the client to sign a waiver or disclaimer, remove any liability for loss arising from the client proceeding, contrary to the advice that's been given. 
Now, on the issue of indemnity cover, Robert, good morning. I wonder if you could just share with me the types of cover that Stuart Title could provide where we're saying to our client who is bleating about wanting to complete and uh, being annoyed as we are with the fact that our local authority is unable to produce a local land charge search in the near future. So we're in a situation where we've spoken to the client about choices and the client is saying, well, yeah, I'm happy to think about an indemnity policy. Robert, what sort of indemnity insurance cover are you able to provide in this context? Thank you, Ian. Yeah, well, we can offer uh, really three different types of uh, standard policies online. Uh, there is a simple no search one where you aren't going to do a search and you want to rely on yeah. insurance, uh, which is there and as simple as it says. Uh, but probably more useful for clients is a search delay policy where you have submitted the full written search, which I think is always best policy to do. Um, but yeah. it's the results, the results are not available, or some of the results are not available when you need to exchange and complete. So our search delay policies uh, would normally cover uh, local land charges, we're talking about here, but also local authority inquiries, uh, mines and mineral searches as well. And if all or any of those are not available at completion, it provides cover for you uh, there. There's also in circumstances where you are uh, dealing with a property which has been transacted recently or perhaps refinancing a search validation policy um, so that if you have a search which is under two years old, uh, you can take out a policy which effectively resuscitates that and you can rely upon it. So they're all available. And we have, uh, through some of the search integration partners who we work with, some more specialist ones, we do have a couple of policies dealing with, uh, I don't know if we're talking later about the Hackney situation where uh, yeah. the computer hack has prevented them supplying this information. We do have a specific one there dealing with that. Um, right. and other ones with some of the search products. So they are available, they do give protection. Um, obviously, you do need to explain to your client what insurance does and what it doesn't do. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So certainly there's a, a breadth of policy that's sitting out there. And the other thing that's really interesting is the changing tack of renders with regard to these policies. I don't know if you've seen this, Robert, but certainly because of COVID and problems with Hackney and others, a lot of lenders are now far more comfortable with the idea of a search delay policy or a no search policy. Certainly, they seem very comfortable with the delay search policies that you just mentioned. Were you aware of that, Robert? And have you seen the sort of things that I've seen with regard yeah. to announcements from various lenders? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we did yeah. see, I think just before Christmas, a couple of the major lenders say they'll accept search delay policies. Um, so it is coming more in favour. Uh, some of them still rather uh, cruelly throw it back onto the lawyer to be responsible, uh, but they yeah. are now willing to accept them. Yeah, good point. Thank you for that. Good. So this idea about is a search necessary? The answer is yes. And I've emphasised the fact that we need to be really cautious if we've got a cavalier client who's saying, hey, I'm not buying with a mortgage and I don't really care. Do make sure that you protect yourselves. So that is one of the situations. There are a number where I want client to sign um, an attendance note or to send a client a copy of a conversation that I've had. So I'd make a contemporaneous note of a conversation I've had with the client. I'll send it to the client and ask the client to confirm what's the true record of the conversation that we've had and an email sort of following up just to confirm what the advice is and the fact the client is happy to proceed without it. And as Robert was saying, given the fact that there are so many policies out there, given the fact that I guess, Robert, the premiums are fairly competitive, um, it makes sense for the client, even the most cavalier of clients, to sit back and have a think about taking out a policy to protect themselves. Um, why is it necessary? Well, as I mentioned in the notes, the significant point there at uh, page three, um, any matter registered as a local land charge is binding on the, the land and buying, binding on the buyer of the land. A notice or lack of it is not relevant at all. And that's courtesy of section 198 of the Law Property Act 1925, which I've set out in the notes. And I've also mentioned this 1927 case, and you may be familiar with, three foreseen Holborn's contract, where uh, Jajeev had a look at this and said, well, yeah, a buyer was deemed to have contracted with actual notice of a registered charge, irrespective of his actual knowledge. 
and was not able to avoid the contract as a consequence. And Schedule 1 and Schedule 3 Land Registration Act 2002 make, make a mention that the fact that the local land charge is an overriding interest. So it's absolutely essential that clients are aware of that fact and aware of the fact that the land charge is binding in any event. And of course, I think this is something again that I see people miss, that a local land charge is likely to impose some form of burden, potentially a financial burden on the property. So the client needs to be aware of that fact and aware of the potential liability relating to it before contracts are exchanged. There are a number of conveyancing issues that I mentioned in the notes that I want to explore with you now. This is at page four going forward. And there are some things that, of course, you'll be familiar with. There'll be some things that you are not familiar with. For, of course, the obvious thing is search, local land charges search is required as part of the due diligence process. Given with delays that some local authorities are meeting us with, we've got to ensure that we consider a local authority land charges search as swiftly as possible or to consider taking out indemnity insurance or making the application for the search and taking out delayed indemnity insurance. And the next thing I want to talk about, which perhaps isn't so obvious, is the fact that a local land charge, the existence of a local land charge, is likely to amount to a latent defect in title, meaning that the seller would be obliged to disclose its existence. And this can create some interesting arguments and debates where an error is made with regard to a local land charge that isn't recorded on the local land charges register, but the seller is aware of the local land charge. In those circumstances, in any circumstances, the seller is obliged to disclose the existence of the local land charge. The authority for that is a case called Rignal Developments, which I've given you in the notes at page four. Um, it's important to understand that, that the standard conditions of sale don't relieve the seller of this obligation to disclose. And the interesting thing about this case of Rignal Developments, which I was reading again over the weekend, is that uh, back in 1987, the court in this case, I think it was Mr Justice Millett, was bleating about the problems that were occurring, particularly in London, with regard to delays relating to local land charges and describing it as a scandal even then. So it's quite interesting that whilst today we've got exactly the same problem, all those years ago there was exactly the same problem. It's only now that steps are being taken to alleviate the problem courtesy of the land registry coming to the rescue. The next thing I mentioned in the notes, which again is something that um, you may not be aware, I asked, can the contract specify that a buyer is deemed to have notice of any local land charge, whether she's or he has had actual notice at the point of contract? And section 24 of the Law Probably Act 1969 applies to this and states that where a buyer lacks actual notice of a registered land charge at the point of contract, any stipulation in the contract deeming the buyer to have notice would be void. About a week ago, I was asked about a sort of tale that I've given you in the notes of page five, top of, well, bottom of page four, top of page five. And this was a situation where a council had uh, provided a grant to some property owners for about £10,000 to assist them to carry out flood defence work. And there was a policy, part of which I've provided in the notes, relating to an obligation to repair the, repay the grant on change of ownership. The important point with regard to this was the property was sold, the grant wasn't repaid. The grant was referred to as a local land charge. Now, it seems that there was some debate as to what had happened relating to the existence of the charge. Had the local authority forgot to register the land charge in the local land charges register, if that was the case, they wouldn't be able to claim repayment from the buyer, but could claim from the original seller. Was the register defective in that it? Uh, had been notified to be placed on the register but not inserted on the register at the relevant time? Or was the search defective? Well, in this particular case, a personal search had been undertaken and in investigating what had gone wrong, the council had clearly clarified the position 
by explaining when the property was being considered for purchase by the buyers, a personal search company was employed. They didn't pay for or request details of what outstanding de debts were applicable under the above legislation. Well, this sort of highlights a number of things. Historically, there have been problems with regard to personal searches, either as a consequence of a personal search provider not inspecting or registers, or more commonly, local authorities refusing or being reluctant to allow all registers to be inspected. The important point with regard to this case is that it is absolutely essential that where you're using a personal search provider, you undertake checks and audits of that provider to make sure that they are being code compliant, more on that in a moment or two, and notifying you if there's a problem with regard to access to registers or facilities to inspect registers. Now again, luckily, as we're going to see in a moment or two with the new migration process, personal searches can be undertaken via the new land registry system, but those searches are undertaken electronically rather than actually having to attend the relevant local land charges department and physically inspecting registers. So hopefully this problem, this type of problem, which I've seen on a number of occasions, to be honest with you, uh, won't apply in the future. So does the search matter? Definitely here was a situation where a buyer was liable for £10,000 potentially, unless he or she was able to claim an indemnity from the search provider or from the buyer's solicitors. Personal searches have in the past caused problems. It is important to check the provider to make sure that the provider is doing what they ought to do. But hopefully, he said with his fingers crossed, uh, personal searches via the new system will be a lot safer and a lot more secure to avoid the sort of problem that my cautionary tale generates. If you look at page six of the notes, I talk about personal searches in a little more detail. Section 8 of the Local Land Charges Act 1975 permits personal searches. In, in, indeed, it's the very heart of the system of local land charges searches. And what we're going to see with regard to the new land registry system is exactly the same facility for personal access, albeit not actually physically attending the land registry, but dealing with personal searches online. I mentioned the code of practice for search compilers and retailers, and in the notes I've given you more detail relating to that. Uh, a number of things really in connection with the code are quite useful to prevent the sort of problem that I just mentioned earlier arising, making sure that there are complete search results or advising the client or customer when complete results will not be available, making sure that as far as sources of information are concerned, if additional sources or resources are required, that clients are made aware of the fact that information is available and identifying additional costs or delays that may be involved where additional information is sought. And of course, advising clients where required information is unobtainable. It is also necessary, of course, to be compliant that the appropriate amount of professional indemnity insurance is available in connection with the property. Uh, in connection with the search rather relating to the property. It leads me to a point with regard to uh, indemnity cover. Do watch where you're buying high-end property. Uh, I had an email last week from someone who generates an issue as a consequence of buying a property at £27 million pounds and the provider of a service uh, that is potentially negligent only carries cover of five million pounds. Uh, hopefully the claim will not exceed that amount of money, but it could do. And in those circumstances, the argument is, was the lawyer negligent in using that uh, source of information, knowing or failing to check the level of indemnity cover that they were, in, they were carrying? A few years ago, I dealt with a negligence claim where precisely that happened with regard to an environmental search. The environmental search and report was produced, the provider of the report was carrying indemnity cover of £4 million. There was a claim made with regard to an omission relating to the report that was worth £10 million. And the issue there, which led to a notification of a claim to the solicitors and insurers, was uh, is it incumbent on you as a solicitor to check the level of indemnity cover that the provider is carrying to determine whether or not there's any exposure or vulnerability for the client? 
the matter was settled, to be honest with you, it wasn't litigated, but it did highlight something that I've been constantly aware of ever since. I mentioned in the notes um, that personal searches are possible with regard to search providers. It's also possible for a solicitor to undertake the search themselves. It is uh, um, dangerous from a, from a solicitor's perspective to do that. I'll explain why in a moment or two. It's also necessary to make sure that where a personal search is being undertaken and a plan is required, the plan is accurate. And we've already had a number of debates, haven't we, over recent months about the quality of plans that we're producing and utilising for clients. I wouldn't be relying on a land registry title plan as an appropriate search plan with regard to a local land charge on the basis, as we mentioned in the past, that title plans are not necessarily accurate and may not contain all the appropriate land that the search is required to be against. I mentioned the notes that when we're doing a personal search currently of a local authority, there are a number of registers that require inspection and local authority should have an index enabling relevant registers to be identified and traced for the relevant property. Um, if the local authority is computerized, then the task could be significantly simpler. And in essence, either the local authority will produce the uh, computer generated information or alternatively allow the searcher to view the result via a computer facility at the local land charges department. I do mention with regard to personal searches that the position with regard to lenders needs to be checked. And just as we were talking to Robert a little earlier with regard to indemnity insurance, I would, on every transaction, just do a quick check to see, is my lender willing to accept a personal search? Is my lender willing to accept indemnity insurance with regard to the lack of or a delay with a local land charges search? Again, with regard to negligence claims, unfortunately, you often see a situation where, well, I'm dealing with the Halifax Building Society, I'm dealing with NatWest, I'm dealing with the Skipton Building Society, I know what their policy is with regard to personal searches. I know what their policy is with regard to delayed uh, local land charges indemnity policies. Well, you might have known what their position was a week ago, a fortnight ago, or a month ago. Do you know what the position is as of today? absolutely essential that you check or someone within your organization checks and again where we're using search providers it is important that we've got some form of audit trail with regard to our search providers that we're able to uh, confirm that they've got adequate indemnity insurance and we know what their practices and procedures are and whether they're code compliant or not the vast majority of search providers of course will be code compliant but again, where we're using a new provider, important to check and important to look at the terms and conditions of trade and level of indemnity cover that they're carrying. There are three potential problems with regard to personal searches, and I deal with these issues at page eight of the notes. Personal searches, the obvious danger of overlooking a relevant entry in the register. I remember years ago, um, there was a personal search provider, a sort of one-man band in the Leicester area uh, that I came across in connection with the negligence claim. And this guy had a very cavalier attitude to uh, inspecting the local land charges registers. He also had a very enlightened attitude with regard to the environment. His attitude being that if I have to go every other day down to the relevant uh, local land charges department, I'm going to be traveling in a diesel car, uh, spewing fumes left, right and centre. Therefore, if I've done a local land charges search of a property in a street in the last three years, then why can't I just simply use that information in connection with an updated search for a new property in the area? Well, that uh, interesting attitude didn't last very long and uh, unfortunately the person concerned didn't last very long in business either, as you can imagine. So, first point, most co more, more commonly than that in the past, search providers being unable to access and inspect all registers. And again, you see that with regard to personnel problems with local uh, authority land charges departments at the moment. And important to understand that Section 13 of the Local Land Charges Act 1975, which generates protection, particularly for solicitors who undertake an official search, it doesn't protect search providers sisters or conveyances in connection with 
um, personal searches. So important, I think, just to be careful about personal searches to make sure that the personal search provider that we're utilizing is carrying the appropriate cover. Next point to note, indemnity policies. Robert's kindly explained the policies that are available. Um, and it's important to advise clients, as uh, Robert mentioned, just what the policy covers and what it doesn't cover, and also to check your instructions in connection with lenders. I mentioned some points uh, with regard to levels of indemnity cover that's being provided, and also mention what cover is provided. And again, Robert, um, I'm just looking at uh, sort of matters generally. Are really, we're looking at a policy with regard to a delayed search that would generate cover to the extent that there's a diminution in value of a relevant property or the amount of any financial charge that is going to require to be paid out as a consequence of uh, an adverse entry with regard to the search. Would that be a fair sort of summary of what the policy would cover? Yes, exactly. I mean, it would be the diminution in value. Um, theoretically, yeah. that could be uh, a wipeout or certainly a wipeout of the lender's interest. Uh, we do yeah. just to clear, have some policies which can provide uh, protection for lenders only, but the majority and probably the safest right. one is a standard policy that covers both the buyer and the lender um, and their successors in title. Yeah, yeah. And Robert, I've also mentioned in the notes that some policies don't cover loss arising from any matter which the buyer was aware of at the date cover commenced and changes of use implemented less than 12 months before the date on which cover commenced and loss which is recoverable under, under any household policy. That sort of standard stuff, is it? Uh, that is standard. We are, in fact, at the moment uh, looking at and changing most of our search policies to actually reduce that 12-month period to six months um, there right. because uh, to yeah. make it a bit more useful for people. Uh, but yes, otherwise, yes. If you're aware of it or you've been made aware of it, even if you didn't notice it, uh, then it wouldn't be covered. Yeah. And is it right to think that um, loss arising from identification or registration of land as contaminated land is also commonly excluded? Uh, it is from these. There are uh, po specific policies to environmental matters, but it wouldn't be covered by a standard yeah. research policy. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, as I've emphasized, I think, to practitioners on a number of occasions, and I'm, again, apologize for bleating on about it, but do be careful with contaminated land major major problem if land is contaminated current owner is potentially in the firing line for decontamination costs uh, and that is a potential nightmare given what may be necessary with regard to decontamination so someone emailed me last week about this question you know a leaseholder um you know is the leaseholder only a 99 year lease of a residential flat going to encounter problems with regard to decontamination if the flat, the block of flats in which the flat is situated, is situated on contaminated land? And the answer is, well, yes, there is the potential, either directly or indirectly, for liability. Direct liability, because as an occupier of the land, you can be liable for decontamination. Indirect liability, because if the landlord is liable, he's going to transmit the cost that he incurs or takes the hit on into service charge. Acting for lenders we've covered. Um, and whilst it's right to say that lenders have been wary in connection with um, indemnity policies, there is a re relaxation. And as mentioned, Nat West, Skipton, and a lot of other ones are now sort of looking at the position and uh, confirming that they're happy to proceed. Again, not all are, and some change fairly frequently, so just keep checking. Interesting to see when the SDLT uh, window closes, what the position will be with regard to um, lenders. Also interested to see what the position will be once we get a full migration of local land charges to the land registry. Because in those circumstances, given the fact that theoretically this is going to be instant access 24-7, um, with regard to an official search or personal searches being able to undertake, be undertaken online, he said um, optimistically, this may mean that some of the problems that we have been encountering for donkey's years, as we saw in that case, disappear. 
and that the obtaining of local land charges search and official search should be a relatively swift and painless exercise. Some key issues then with regard to local land charges, and I mentioned this at page 10 of the notes. When acting for a buyer, consider the following. Client objective, and could a local land charge impact on that objective? I'm just doing some work at the moment, and one of the things that we're looking at is the connectivity with regard to due diligence processes. And as part of that connectivity, looking at client objective. So again, you know, if there are issues with regard to listed buildings or planning conditions or smoke control orders or tree preservation orders, how do these impact on client objective? Next thing, how long is it going to take a search provider to generate a local land charges search? We need to be considering that at the start of the transaction where client objective is a swift move with regard to a purchase is a local land charges search still being dealt with by a local authority going to cause problems and where an indemnity policy is chosen what is the issue with regard to that um, policy how what what's its extent what's the premium what does it cover uh, we mentioned personal searches and again if a personal search is sought or necessary does the client understand the position and the limitations of a personal search as, a, as opposed to an official search and again we should be having an audit trail with regard to our search providers so that if anyone questions what the search provider has or hasn't done in the future we can confirm that they are a member of the appropriate uh, professional organization and they are code compliant amongst other things a search doesn't afford protection for buyers as it only shows the state of register at the time a search was made. It is possible to get a warning of impending land charges by making inquiries of the local authority search in Form Con 29. But again, it's important to understand that this search is a snapshot of time and showing us the position with regard to the register at the point of search. You'll be aware that Section 10 of the Local Land Charges Act 75 provides some compensation where there's an error on the search certificate or where a matter is binding on the land but is not revealed by the search and wasn't registered at the time of the search. As we've already seen, as I mentioned, this entry is binding on the land in a bio whether or not it's revealed by the search. So, absolutely essential we understand those basics. What will the search reveal? We know about that, don't we? The point that I want to highlight, however, with regard to uh, the entries that the search reveals is what we deal with them. And this is important. Looking at case law, looking at what the courts have said about due diligence in residential transactions, there is a common theme. That common theme, quite simply, is this. It is not enough to tell the client this property is subject to a listed building consent. This property is in a smoke control order. This property is subject to tree preservation orders, but we've got to explain the significance of that. So if there's an empty dwelling management order, what's the position relating to it? If there's enforcement notices that have been served relating to the property, what are the implications of that? As a residential conveyancer, you're not a planning expert, you're not a tree expert, you're not a listed building expert or whatever. You are, however, required to advise the client that in order to protect the client's position, additional information can be sought or expert views or opinions gained with regard to whatever the search generates. So I think that's the important takeaway from this slide and this particular point. You're not required to be an expert. You are a reasonable conveyancer, a reasonable transactional lawyer. That is the test. A reasonable conveyance or a reasonable transactional lawyer where they're looking at planning obligations, street preservation orders, conservation area orders or whatever else. Depending on client's objective, depending on client's sensitivity, we should be going and advising the client about sources and resources that will be available so the client is fully informed and again can then consent to proceeding with the transaction or take an alternative view. I hark back to this point about informed consent, which I think is so important. 
I've given you cases of Orient Holdings and Burge and, Burge and another case involved with Taylor Walton. These cases just reiterate that point that I've made on a number of occasions before. Where you've got an adverse entry relating to a search, you tell the client about that entry, you advise the client about what should be done in order to clarify the position in order to protect your client. You're not expected to give planning advice, you are simply uh, uh, required to tell the client about what can be done to gain further information relating to the planning issue and the appropriate advice that's required flowing from that, from whoever you deem would be appropriate to give that advice. So this, those cases are nothing new, they're just showing to an extent the limit of your role, but also confirming that a failure to do that simple task, hey Mr. Client, this is what the local land charges search reveals, this is what we can now do to protect your position and to examine further the issues that are generated by that result or by that search entry. Important, as I say, it is amazing how frequently those issues are overlooked. Again, I was doing some work over the weekend, it shows you really how sad I am, I should get out more. But I was doing uh, some work looking at uh, professional indemnity insurers reports, and one of the things that they were sort of highlighting, clear as day, is the fact that uh, claims and types of claim against residential conveyances are moving away from procedural errors, more to advice errors, so a failing to advise clients about consequences rather than about a failing to, a failure to do something. And that's important. And again, that's something I've seen um, for a couple of years now, but it's sort of brought starkly home over the weekend. And I was reading, as I say, quite a lot of information about data relating to negligence claims. Okay, enough of the bad news. Let's look at the good news. Migration to the land registry. Happy days. The idea of this process should mean that we've got one standardised system. So whether we've got a property in Truro, a property in Northumberland, a property in Carlisle or a property in Kent, we're going to have a standard fee. We're going to have a standard process. We're going to have search results that are subject to a state-backed indemnity. And we're going to have 24-7 access and we're going to have a facility for an official search or a personal search, depending on circumstances. Significantly, we're going to have an unlimited repeat search facility for a period of six months to check for any new charges before completing a transaction. But the big thing, in my view, is this instant online access. Fantastic, isn't it? In theory, that we can immediately uh, and instructions in connection with the purchase, get this search out of the way, sort of there and then, as it were. A search history dashboard, uh, and we'll talk about this a little more in a moment or two, gives access to previous searches at any time, and records are held in standard electronic form. Now, it's important to understand that where we have a query with regard to listed buildings or planning conditions, the land registry will retain some information to assist us, but it might be necessary for the land registry or us to make inquiry of the relevant local authority for further detail and further information. The migration procedure is quite a task and quite an exercise for local authorities. But to be fair to the land registry, and I try to be, there is uh, a number of systems that the land registry have put in place that make life easier. There is, in essence, a data analyst dashboard tool. And uh, I was amazed when I looked at this to see just what it involves. In essence, it's a checklist that enables a local authority to see what uh, information the land registry require and to assist with regard to the generation and creation of that information. There is then a migration helper that sort of set, sets out the system and process to enable information that the local authority is holding to be transmitted to the land registry. That information could be electronic, it could be paper files. Uh, importantly, the uh, land registry do require local authorities to retain a system of authority file references, so that if a local land charge is revealed by a search of the land registry and the search uh, 
provider or solicitors will require further information, it's a relatively simple exercise to get that information from the relevant local authority. Practice Guide 79 has been issued and it specifies who provides the search, how local land charges are registered and how local land charges are varied or cancelled. In essence, what you've got with regard to these processes are a number of things. Firstly, the um, land registry has a number now of local authorities where migration has taken place to determine whether or not a local authority has migrated you can simply make inquiry of the land registry. If you were to make inquiry of the local authority, then the local land charges department would quickly advise you of the position. Local land charges are registered at the land registry, but of course the local land charge itself may be generated by the local authority or other body, and local land charges can be varied or cancelled by local authorities uh, or by the relevant body. Important to understand, however, that the land registry has the power to vary or cancel local land charges, but looking at it, all the guidance from the land registry is that this power would be used very sparingly indeed, and I can't really think of a situation where the land registry would of their own volition vary or cancel a local land charge without uh, either a local authority or relevant other authority or concerned property owner sort of intimating to the land registry that there was an issue with regard to the entry. As far as searching the local land charges register is concerned, some good news. The official search should be available 24-7, should be available relatively simply, and should produce a search certificate. That, con that will provide the state indemnity that is useful. There should be electronic links to relevant documents which the land registry holds or electronic links to information or documentation that local authorities hold. And there is available to repeat the search for a period of six months after the official search is issued. As far as a personal search is concerned, <clears throat> there is a facility rather via the Government UK website, local land charges service, to do a personal search electronically. The only thing that I can see looking at that is that the land registry do emphasise that uh, the system is rather clunky for searches of large areas, and therefore a personal search of a vast area of land uh, may not be appropriate. So that seems to be the warning from the land registry. But again, you know, in a residential context, how common is it going to be that we're going to be searching large areas? The most common thing we are going to be searching is an individual property. Um, I mentioned in the notes a number of points that I think are relevant. Firstly, as far as the application is concerned for an official search, it is possible to utilise the local land charges maintain surface, uh, service or application programming interface. It is also possible to utilize the land registry portal in that connection to gain information relating to local land charges. I have in the notes uh, mentioned a number of things that I think are important. <clears throat> Where we are undertaking a search, an official search, we're going to pay £15. Personal searches are free. In either case, the land registry will give you a description of local land charge that applies, registration date, and details of authority that can answer questions about the local land charge. An official search is a secure, digitally signed and guaranteed document generated by the land registry, which ens ensures authenticity. Important to understand that the search will also generate the same electronic link that a personal search would. It will show the local land charge boundary where the charge starts and stops, and it will have this facility for unlimited downloads of an official certificate for the next six months. So quite an interesting system, quite a new system. From a practitioner's perspective, I have in the notes at page 23 onwards, Describe the process. 
in order to comply with the requirements of the land registry, it will be necessary either to state the postal address of the property, if the land is registered, to state the extent of the registered title. If you're using a property that doesn't have a postal address or searching against the property doesn't have a postal address, you can use a land registry map to draw the extent of the land to be searched against. It is also possible to do a search by reference to a title number. The one thing I would say is be careful with regard to the land registry map where we're drawing the extent of the land to be searched against. Again, I can see a situation where an error is made with regard to that drawing and all the land that needs to be searched against is not incorporated within the search. Uh, other points that I mentioned, <clears throat> Requesting information or copies of documents, you start by asking the land registry, but the land registry doesn't have the information, then you can make a request to the relevant local authority. <clears throat> Other points that I think are significant, mistakes in registration or search results, then again, the important point there is to contact the relevant originating authority, the local authority, to query the position. The search will give you contact details for that authority. Where there is an issue with regard to a mistake or search result, then the position, sorry, mistake in registration or search result, then it is possible for the originating authority to investigate and to resolve the application by making application to land registry to vary or cancel the relevant local land charge. Compensation, again, Section 10 of the Land Charges Act 1975 applies, entitling a buyer to compensation for any loss suffered. And I'll just read this in consequence, if a material, official or personal search was made before the relevant time, and if the search or official search certificate failed to reveal a local land charge that was in existence at the time the search was made. This compensation is available for a buyer of land for valuable consideration. And what is a material search? The answer is a material search is a search made by or on behalf of a buyer or before the relevant time the buyer or, or his agent has knowledge of the result of the search or the content of an official search. So there is some quite specific detail about the availability of compensation, but in short, what you've got is exactly the same compensatory regime as you had with regard to a local land charges search of a local authority. To conclude today then, what have we got? Hopefully, I've given you the background with regard to local land charges and drawn some awareness to a number of situations. The client that says, I don't want a local land charges search, the availability of indemnity insurance, the obligation of a seller to disclose as a latent encumbrance any local land charge that the seller is aware of. We've looked at a tale where a buyer, in essence, bought a property and took a hit for £10,000 and it was necessary to seek redress from search provider and solicitor with regard to that loss. We've got a regime that should make life a lot easier for everyone concerned with regard to due diligence, search providers, solicitors and conveyances. As far as the land registry is concerned, I think there's about 27 um, local authorities that have migrated or in the process of migration. I can tell you the land registry is stepping this up and uh, what we should see is hopefully within two years of today the vast majority of local land charges being held by the land registry and this new regime applying. Steve, I am conscious of questions and I am conscious of um, whether or not Robert has any points to note but subject to that there are two or three other things that I just want to mention before we finish. First of all, the Environment Information Regulations 2004. Environment information held by public authorities must be available to the public. An online personal search of the land registry will reveal information held by relevant authorities concerning environmental information. Uh, also important to understand that as far as this idea of local authority information concerning environmental issues is concerned, it does not alleviate 
the need to have an environmental search and report. The information that local authorities have with regard to contaminated land and environmental issues is limited. Conclusions. Watch out for local authorities migrating. Search providers are all over this, to be honest with you, and well ahead of the game, so there's nothing to worry about with regard to that. Do revisit your advice to clients. Stephen, question time, my favourite part of the presentation. Any questions or issues arising? Excellent, yes, thank you, Ian. Um, we're now going to be getting on from the questions submitted from today's presentation. So just as a reminder, you can submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. We have already had a number of questions in Ian, actually, so I'm not sure if I necessarily want to invite too many more. Um, let's yeah. start from uh, Stuart. Stuart asks, as the existence of a local land charge would constitute a latent defect in title and standard condition three of the national conditions of sale fifth edition does not relieve the seller of this obligation, should the seller brackets as well as the buyer therefore carry out a local search? Yeah, well, it's an interesting argument. Um, Texts vary, to be honest with you, and the matter seems to be, in my view, that a seller shouldn't. It's only if the seller is aware of the existence of a local land charge that the existence of that charge should be disclosed as a latent encumbrance. I don't think it's necessary for a seller to go looking for encumbrances to disclose. My reading, and I've checked this over again at the weekend, is that if you're aware of it, you disclose it. You don't have to actively look for local land charges in order to disclose them as a late incumbent. So there'd be an inherent danger, in my view, of doing a local land charges search just to check for the existence of a local land charge, just so that these then disclosed as a late incumbent. I think the position is with regard to that case law, if you're aware of it, so if your client knows that they've got a grant for doing some remedial work relating to flooding, then you disclose its existence. But you wouldn't do a local land charges search just to check if there's anything outstanding or anything revealed by a local land charge that would need to be disclosed to a buyer. The point there, Stephen, quite simply is this. The expectation is that the buyer will do a local land charges search and would identify the existence of local land charges that would bite the buyer. So, in short, it's a great question from Stuart. My view would be, if the seller is actually aware of a local land charge, it is disclosed. Whilst there's some debate about whether a seller should do a local land charges search, my view is that it would be unwise to do so on the basis that the buyer is probably going to do it anyway and on the basis that as far as a latent encumbrance is concerned it would be have to be something the seller was aware of so you're really relying on the seller telling you about it which leads me to an interesting point actually Stephen I think it may be prudent to ask the seller if you're getting instructions from a client if they're aware of any grants or any uh, loans that have been taken out that could be subject to local land charges. But in essence, the TA forms are going to deal with that. Great question from Stuart, though. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. And thanks, Ian. Um, Sally asks, how long is the protection from the search against matters being registered on the local land charges register? After all, there can be quite a delay between the search date and completion. Yeah. Well, as far as the search is concerned, this is, this is a great point. The search is out of date the moment you do it, Stephen. Mm. So let's assume that we get our local land charges search result in today. Then the position is that the indemnity that the local authority or land registry is providing is that there is a defect with regard to the information that's been provided. So there is a local land charge that's not recorded on the register. Yeah. But thereafter, there isn't any cover, though, there isn't any protection. So if I register a local land charge, you having got the result today, I do that tomorrow, there isn't any protection with regard to that local land charge that's placed on the type, uh, placed on the register tomorrow. So in short, I mean, the, the point to note is that if, you, if, the, if there is the slightest hint from the seller or from your buyer client about a planning issue or a planning dispute, then 
you would need to do another local land charges search to see the position. And hopefully your inquiries of the local authority will reveal any local land charges that are pending. And of course, remember that where we're talking about financial charges, Stephen, the primary responsibility will be on the seller to discharge. Where yeah. the seller has failed to do that, then there is a risk of the buyer incurring liability. But to answer the question, another good question, you can't protect a buyer from a local land charge being placed on the register after you've done your search. So I suppose the logical thing to do where we've got this facility via the land registry would be to do the search immediately before exchange of contract. So we're exchanging contract this afternoon, do your search this morning. The chances of a local land charge being placed on the register between you're doing the search at 10 a.m. this morning and you're exchanging contracts at 12 o'clock this afternoon are remote. The only caveat that I would say with regard to that process would be this. You need to make sure that you've got the time to look at the local land charge search that you've done and the search result to see if there are any adverse entries before exchanging. But in short, you can't do anything that offers yourself protection during the intervening period between getting your local land charges search in and exchanging contract. Under the new land registry system, where you've got an official search, you will be able to refresh your search. I suppose that would be something that might assist us going forward. So yeah. we would get our search result in today, Stephen. We're exchanging contracts in three weeks time. Under the new regime, I'll be able to refresh my search. The day of com the day I exchange contracts or the morning of exchange contracts. So that might help. But right, all of these things, there isn't, a, you know, it's not like a land registry search. There isn't a priority period that a local land charges search generates, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah. Just a couple more. Uh, so, a question from Megan. Megan says, in practice, conveyances surely need a wider search provider to approach land registry director, uh, land registry directly, with partial coverage and only LLC and not CON29 covered by Land Registry. Land Registry is just one of many result, search result providers. It's too hard for busy conveyances to remember who has migrated and who hasn't yeah. and to do more work or yeah. searches. Yeah, great point. I mean, that, that's why I think search providers sort of come into their own in doing this sort of fil filtering system for us. I think, you know, that that's in the idea of a conveyance and not having a search provider, trying to decide which searches are necessary, then deciding, well, where do I do my search, etc. You know, that just becomes an impossible task in my view, Stephen. I think, you know, if, if, if nothing else, and certainly on speaking to the land registry, they have throughout this process been keen to ensure that search providers are on board so that search providers provide this the system of identifying which local authority has migrated, making life easier for the land registry local authorities and for conveyances. Perfect. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Megan, for that question. This next question, um, question. from Robert. It, it, I, I may bring Robert Kelly in on this to, to help this question, but Ian, yeah. if you want to have a crack. Uh, the, the search policies that Stuart are able to offer cover, uh, sorry, the search policies that Stuart are able to offer cover the position where a search would have re re revealed something and had a search been carried out at the relevant date, what is the position where the property is adversely affected but the local authority do not know about the problem and so there is nothing on the land charges register at the relevant date? Notwithstanding the insurance, the property is still adversely affected. Is this the buyer's problem yeah. or a problem for the solicitor acting for the buyer? Yeah, but let's just let's just think about this. So what we're saying is there's a local land charge in existence that's not registered. If that was the case, Stephen, the position would be that the buyer would be bound by it, but would be able to claim an indemnity either from the land registry if it's migrated or from the local authority if it hadn't. 
So I don't think it's quite the problem that you would imagine at first blush. I think, if yeah. I'm reading the question correctly. Robert, what do you think about that one? Have I got that right? Or do you think that the question's different? I'm just trying to rock my brain as to... Uh, yeah, and I, th I think you're right. The, the, as you've said earlier in replies, the essence of the register is it's a register of matters uh, maintained by the local authority and then published now through the land registry. So if they've failed to put something on there, they are at fault. And quite often yeah. uh, when we have a claim under any of these policies, we will look at what was on the register at the time. And quite often you'll find yeah. that the, quite often, sometimes you'll find local authority have failed to put it on. Um, so I think you are, uh, as regards the searching insurance, you wouldn't have been aware if you'd done a search. So you're in the yeah. same position with search insurance. And it's then a matter of uh, bringing a claim against the local authority for failing to keep the register yeah. up to date. Uh, and then as yeah. you say, if it actually been registered afterwards, then, um, uh, it would have, you wouldn't have been protected anyway by a search. Um, yeah, one, one thing in just thinking about when you were talking about search providers and so on, um, we do we are authorised to provide COPSO uh, insurance for uh, information carried out right. by search providers. And I think just to uh, yeah. emphasise that um, back when I was practising, there may have been a little bit of sort of discrimination against personal search. Uh, practitioners, yeah. but now COPSO yeah. authorised in sh uh, search providers so. are as good and secure as a local authority, and I think usually have a, a better record of uh, accuracy than some local authorities do. Yeah, yeah, good point you make, Robert. Yeah, I mean, certainly back in the day when sort of personal searches became sort of uh, prominent, basically last recession, you know, you get um, a search provider, just uh, you know, an individual, just saying, "Well, I've got nothing much more to do, uh, and therefore this, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll invent myself as a search provider." Certainly, all of the search providers that I deal with today, you know, as you say, are absolutely gilt-edged and spot-on, and therefore, you know, just as safe as the local authority itself. So, yeah, you're quite right. That's a good point. See, I think between us, Robert and I have answered that question. I think we have. If we haven't, then uh, feel free for the uh, questioner to uh, drop us a note and we'll sort of take it further. But I think we've covered off the issues that uh, the question generated. Absolutely. No, thank you for that. Um, we just have um, one or two more questions left. So I'll just get through those in. Um, so the, Catherine has, I think, a very live problem, actually, that perhaps we might be able to mm -hmm. help with. Uh, so she said, I've got a situation mm -hmm. where acting for tenant on the granting of a new lease, they don't want to pay for yeah. the searches. Various issues as I have planning concerns. Landlord will not give us land value to obtain a policy quote. Part of a registered title, so can't go off value in official copies. Uh, any yeah. ideas other than asking the client to pay for valuation, which seems excessive just for policy purposes? Uh, yeah. If, if, yeah, I've got an idea with that. What I would do. Uh, is I would ask the client, given the given the risk that we've identified, given the problem that we've identified, what level of premium would you prepare, be prepared to pay? And then what I would do, Stephen, is I would speak to either you or Robert or, or one of your many colleagues and say, right, look, you know, this is the issue. This is the amount of premium that my client is willing to pay for this. What level of indemnity can I can I expect given the premium? I've done that before with commercial clients, where there's been an issue about what the site is worth or what it would be worth when we've developed it, and we've gone round and round in circles trying to determine the level of indemnity. And what I've said is, well, let's let's go a different way and say, how much are you prepared to pay to sort of crystallise the risk? And then gone to an insurer and said, right, what level of premium can we ask you to provide for us, given this amount of premium? Now, I know that would be a lot of work for you, but certainly from a client's perspective, it gets over the problem, which I think the questioner is raising is, is just, you know, how do we determine the level of indemnity? Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and um, I mean, obviously, I, I would say this, but I do think as well that our search policies are, are very reasonably priced and, and depending on yeah. the amount of cover the, the the cost doesn't actually change remarkably whether it's 
300,000 or 3 million. So I think there are definitely yeah. routes around that with the, with the limits. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's an interesting question though, isn't it? Because you could, you, could you could spend a fortune and spend forever trying to assess what, what the value of the, this site is. And particularly in commercial transactions, you know, you might have a client that works their magic. So something that's worth a million pounds today, all of a sudden is worth 12 million pounds, you know, three months, four months time. You just don't know. And therefore, you know, what what I always did with commercial clients is in a situation like that, say, well, all right, let's 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 go the other way and say, what would be an amount of premium you'd be willing to pay to cover up this risk or this potential exposure? But yeah, you're quite right. You know, as far as value for money is concerned. When you look at the potential loss that the client could take, and you combine that, Stephen, with the potential vulnerability of the solicitor or conveyancer with regard to the client taking a hit, you know, uh, indemnity insurance is cheap, isn't it? Because a lot of people look at it as, as, as just saying, well, all right, this is the client's risk. But what they don't take into account is well, if the client takes a hit, the client's going to be looking to see who they can chase with regard to the hit, and often it's their solicitor or conveyancer, isn't it? So if you look at that, and you look at the amount of premium the client is paying, you know, most indemnity policies are cracking good value. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Okay, thanks, Ian, and uh, thank you, Catherine, for that question. Hopefully that has answered the, the issue there, but please do get in touch with those of you who would like to discuss further on that. Um, Ian, I think we'll wrap up the questions there, if that's all right, uh, yeah. unless you had anything to, to add. Um, so that just... Uh, uh, no, Rob, uh, Robert, thank you both. Yeah, no, I think, I think we're all good. So I'll just even say thank you to Ian and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. As I mentioned in the interview, we have included uh, links in the chat section to our YouTube channel, our LinkedIn play page. Please do check those out and give us a subscribe if you do use those platforms. If you do have any other questions, please contact Ian or myself. Once you leave the webinar today, you will receive an automated message from GoToWebinar. If you respond to this email, the replies come directly to me so I can send any questions or feedback you have onto Ian from there. You'll also receive a separate email from my colleague, Robert Kelly, which will uh, contain the slides and notes to today's session within the next 24 to 48 hours. So I'd just even say on behalf of Stuart Title and Ian Quayle, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, Stephen. Bye-bye.